everyone, and welcome to the Onion Podcast, <laughs> the kind of grand reopening again. Uh, I would like to thank everyone watching uh, right now, and we have a very special guest here today. I would like to please welcome, is it me, is it Solchik, sorry, your surname is a bit hard to pronounce. <laughs> Saltisic. Saltisic. Oh, I see, okay. that's what I thought it was, because uh, Kieran thought it was pronounced, the uh, the S was silent, so we thought it was uh, Emidio Saltisic. Salti- Saltisic. <laughs> God, I, I can't speak today. But we were debating before you we, before we arrived. How do we pronounce Saltisic? Mimi Saltisic. Mimi Saltisic. Okay, got it. Yeah, because the thing is, we, we were listening to a few interviews beforehand. Like, yeah, we, we saw that you were on CNBC and stuff. And uh, they, we were like, is, is that how they actually pronounce his name? Or did the anchor's just getting it wrong? Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's why, because I was like, I, I really want to be professional. I want to have his son name. And literally the first channel on it. The newest cast off is like, and uh, now we have Mimi's. Situ- yeah. So like, <laughs> like it took a second. I was like, well, that was helpful. Uh, but sort of, we have the start. tremendous honor of having Mimi. <laughs> Let's take on. Please welcome. Thanks for being on. And thanks yeah. for having me. I appreciate it. So yeah. Right. Shall we? Uh, shall we get right into the uh, to the interview section of the the stream? Or. Yeah. Sure. Let's uh, start that off. Um, right. So I think the the first question we really wanted to ask, uh, Mr. Salty, Mr. Mr. Salty, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. My tongue is not functioning. Mr. <laughs> Saltisic, I'm so sorry. Um, the first question we w- really wanted to find out was, um, is if there was one thing that you wanted, if there's one thing you want everyone to know about your party in America, what would that one thing be? I mean, I you know I think probably the the overarching idea is that you know we see. Uh, capitalism as, you know, it's inherently racist, sexist, oppressive. Obviously, it's terrible for the climate. Um, and um, we're not looking to reform that system because in reforming capitalism, it, it's almost like saying, you know, like we're cool with uh, a kinder, gentler sexism, racism, oppression and all that sort of thing. We're actually seeking the overthrow of capitalism and uh, the, replacing the capitalist system with uh, socialism. Um with community control, with uh, democratic participation, um, and I think to let folks know that you know they they can plug into that movement uh, here in the United States. Um, you know we're here, uh, been here for a long time, and um, you know I kind of feel like we're on the clock when we think of like climate change, mm-hmm. um, and I think now folks can see it in real time. You know that. Our police here are slaughtering our people on a daily basis. You know, our, our military slaughters folks throughout the world on a daily basis. You know, this none of this is acceptable. Um, our tax dollars finance this shit. So um, now's the time to get involved. You know, the the U.S. military budget really is quite. Quite something. I think in uh, I think the president's discretionary budget for 2015 was something like 50.1 percent of the yep. budget just entirely for the U.S. military. It's incredible. Um, it is it is remarkable. It is remarkable that uh, people in America complain about oh the national debt is unredeemably huge. Cut back on the military, surely. Yeah, you think you think that'd be a sensible option, yeah. And another thing I find quite interesting is that when it comes to the whole budget spending, right, you always see people that complain about, oh, there's leeches on welfare, there's leeches on, you know, sort of government f- programs. But we never hear anyone talk about the military. Why, you know, if that's the largest thing we, we spend on, why don't we try to talk about that instead, you know? Yeah, it's like this I still think it comes down to paranoia a little bit. I do think America seems... Well, the way the media presents it is there's threats at every angle, so they try and justify this outrageous spending. Like, oh, we need 50% of the budget to so in case if we don't, Russia's going to come over and attack us or something, or it's going to be China <laughs> or something. Or, yeah. You know, we need to have like every minute, we need to have every square inch of land, at least have one missile on it so we don't get bombed. Yeah, it's this massive like diversion. Like, if there are leeches, the leeches are, you know, uh, the military, the corporate class, you know. I mean, in the U.S., we have a regret, uh, a regressive tax code. You know, the the less you earn, the heavier the tax burden. While you know, the wealthy, the corporate class, they offshore their taxable income. There are tax loopholes, uh, as you all mentioned. The military takes up such a huge part of our budget. Um, so it's almost like, from the political class, it's almost like, don't look over there. You know, we're going to shift the blame, or you know, uh, to the people. 
yeah. it's just not true, you know. It, Fine. you know, the money is there to, you know, provide like, you know, what we see as being fundamental rights. The money's there to do that. Um, it's just being spent, um, you know, on the military, and then, you know, the the, like I said, the the, the corporate class isn't being taxed. Uh, their fair share. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, if I may, there was uh, something you mentioned uh, just now that I'd like to touch on for a moment. You mentioned um, democratic economic participation. Um, how would you define democratic participation in an economic context? Well, so like, you know, we're, what we're looking for is like community control, worker control, um, democratic participation at the local level, at the grassroots level, so that you know, as community members, uh, that we have a say in, in like the institutions that most directly affect right. our lives. Um, you know, now in the U.S., like I, I live in Los Angeles. This is a topic that comes out comes up quite a bit. Is that when we think about community, um, a lot of us don't really don't experience that. You know, we have neighbors, but we we don't really know who they are. You know, folks wake up, they go to work, they come back home, they're tired, uh, they might eat, take care of their families, fall asleep, and then repeat that cycle every day. Yeah. So it, it's, 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 it's a challenge to actually establish those community networks because folks are, are you know, they're, they're so um, beat by the system, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, no they're railroaded things. into one kind of, of path almost, like uh, yeah. go to work, go home, go to work again, go home again. Yep. Whereas there may be another better, more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? More socially uh, open way of, of going about economic uh, participation. Almost. And, and, and really sort of fulfilling, you know? Yeah. Um, this, the, the way that the system is set up here is it's, uh, oh, I see. it's exhausting, oh, yeah, no. you know? It, it's just, it's exhausting. Um, let me tell you, like here in Los Angeles, um, if you're a single parent, you have if you have one child, the minimum amount of money you need to earn just to meet your most basic needs it's it's um, it's called a living wage. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. just under twenty six dollars an hour, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we sort of like hooray when the minimum wage will eventually be raised to fifteen dollars an hour. But even at fifteen dollars an hour, if I'm you're still that, nine dollars behind, yeah, right, and, and it's, it's like you're sinking. Almost ten bucks an hour for every hour that you work. Like this is no way to. It's no way to live. It's, it's, it's like I said. It's, it's exactly. It's exactly that. I mean, yeah. like um, economic. Uh, I think I saw a chart the other day by a, a YouTuber named uh, what's his name? It's uh, the nerd writer one did an excellent video on the subject of the minimum wage, uh, where he uh, there's this chart that suggests that economic uh, the the economy has improved on like a steady basis for the last. 30 years, whereas uh, employee employees, the improvement of employees' personal lives has kind of plateaued, yeah, or it's, a, it's a plateaued about 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. So uh, economic success hasn't really brought with it prosperity for the 99%, no. which is, and, sorry, yeah. And, and the cost of student, um, you know, of uh, yeah. uh, education has just skyrocketed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, job. especially with the student loan crisis in America. That's a very big issue. You know? Right. So it's just like we're in this stage of, ver- you know, it's like various degrees of sinking, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, folks are exhausted and it's easy to feel um, despair. So when we look to like how do we solve this and if we're going to solve this by establishing those community networks and those relationships at the local level, it- it's a real challenge because folks are understandably, they're tired. You know, yeah. right. And I'm gonna ask is because you have you seem to have a lot of you know very strong opinions on that and a very strong passion about it. Sure. I was wondering what was it that inspired you to get into politics? For me personally, yeah. Uh, yeah, just like to, to go from you know to get where where did you start as opposed to where you are now? What made you think you know what I want to do something about this? I want to make make a party. You know, get to the top. Sure, I think um. So for me personally, like I grew up as like a kind of like a skateboarding punk rocker kid. I got in a lot of trouble, um, <laughs> kind of serious trouble. And then in my twenties and my early thirties, I, I played music in a band and um, still got in a lot of trouble. Uh, also was you know had some pretty serious substance abuse problems. I 
damaged my liver. And by my early 30s, I think um, I, I kind of had hit a rock bottom and was sort of at like a crossroads. Like, if I continue in this direction, one, life is probably going to be uh, short for me. Um, yeah. Or I, I can try to um, kind of put the pieces back together, figure out who I am, what the hell am I doing here, you know, um, clear my head. And so I, I chose that to go in that direction. And it was it was tough uh, for for quite some time. It, it took me some time to clear my head and um, try to figure out how to learn again, uh, to put one foot in front of the other, um, to listen again, um, to care about much of anything. But I think once I started to just kind of like take those baby steps forward and started to listen and started to learn a little bit, um, in the process I started to uh, maybe understand a little bit more what community means, understand what my effect and my role as a community member means. Um, and then as you're listening, those voices of suffering here, um, to me, they, they were profound. It was like uh, being hit in the head with a baseball bat, you know, and uh, where yeah. you feel like I just want to fall to my knees, you know. Um, and um, as you're learning and starting to try to discover sort of what is the root cause of this this pain, this suffering that folks are experiencing, um, you know, eventually you're going to be able to identify it as capitalism and also starting to understand that in the U.S., our approaches to um, addressing that core problem, capitalism, are usually um, very like topical. So it's almost like trying to put a Band-Aid on a tumor, you know, like right, yeah. you put a Band-Aid and as you put a Band-Aid, like a hundred new ailments pop up, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wondered, like, well, how do you attack the tumor here, you know, and um, was able to identify as many folks do well that socialism would be sort of your uh, your cure for that cancer mm -hmm. and then just wondered like where does somebody like me go like you know I, I, I mean I'm covered in tattoos I have a pretty uh, I, I don't know if it's sort of a traditional trajectory toward getting to this spot and um, uh, I'm not an academic or what you know wasn't at the time Mm -hmm. It was really in the process of learning. So I asked a lot of people. I did research and eventually found the Socialist Party. And uh, once I joined, I just kind of like dove, dove mm -hmm. in. And I felt like I had wasted so much time personally. Uh, yeah, like, in, point. you know, like, yeah. it's really self-destructive and didn't care about much of anything or myself. And um, so I felt like I had a lot of catch up to do, you know. Right. right, right. And, you know, as soon as you, you just found something that you're very passionate about and you kind of just started climbing the ranks from there. And and really enjoying, like, I, what I found there was we talked a little bit about the beginning, this idea of democratic participation. When I got involved in the Socialist Party where that democratic participation is so key, I, it was like, uh, it almost felt to me like a baby breathing the first air. Like, um, it was almost startling to... Mm -hmm find myself in an environment where like my voice mattered and where it was expected that my voice as everybody's voices, my voice, those ideas, uh, that they would become part of the dialogue and discussion. Um, uh, I, I, it was such a great experience and, um, it's, I, I, I found it at the time very difficult once I got involved with that to then go back to like, um, like my corporate job at the time, you know, where you're back yeah. in sort of the hierarchy and the rat race and that. Yeah. 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 Just like, wow, shit. I, I, this, this democratic participation, like, I feel like this is something, this is how we should experience lives. Like we all, you know, mm -hmm. we, we count, mm -hmm. you know, our voices right. are. So you, you feel that uh, corporate society should be restructured so that it's less entirely focused on the bottom line. Corporate, but I and more focused on like personal fulfillment, I suppose, is what you're I trying to get across. Corporate society should be destroyed. Okay. You know, I, uh, like I said, I'm not interested in reforming um, capitalism and its systems, but rather replacing them with, um, 
you know, uh, systems and structures that uh, lend themselves to a dignified, fulfilling life. Right. Um, if I may, how would you uh, envision, in, in an ideal world, how would you envision kind of going about uh, destroying the corporate society and kind of what would be the replacing it with, what would be the, how would you replace capitalism with, with yeah. uh, socialist uh, kind of socialist structure? Standard. Yeah. Sure. So um, you're talking about like a transition from capitalism to socialism? Uh, so just kind of how would you get from the way America is now to right. what America, you would say? Way, how does it go from the America as it is now to the America you want it to be? Well, what would be the steps? That go sure. So, yeah. so I think what, what would need to happen is, and, and kind of what we're working on all the time, is establishing those community relationships um, and as we work to establish those community relationships, doing so with an eye toward um, identifying pressure points within the capitalist system, strategic planning to address those pressure points uh, in a way that dismantles those, uh, those systems, and also the planning um, to replace those uh, points within the system with uh, with uh, socialist alternatives, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, again, very hard work uh, of because course. you know, like right. here, we're we're, we're at, we are dealing with first tackling that that the issue of establishing community relationships. That that's a big challenge. You know, we're talking about neighbors um, and and really sort of basic issues like trust. Um, you know, how do we go about that? So that's something that, like, with this particular campaign here that, that we're focused on heavily. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in, in, in terms of that, once you kind of get from there, what do you do about the political system? Like, um, would the actual political mainframe of the country change under a socialist mindset? Because right now you've got, you know, President, Congress, Senate, House of Representatives and that. Would that system as a fund fundamentally stay the same or would that need to be changed as well? Would the structure need to be altered to fit in with a more socialist political mindset? I, th- I mean, I think we would be talking about some really profound changes. Um, and th- th- be- when we consider sort of the sky, the size and scope of the U S political system and how, um, powerful, uh, th- that institution is, we yeah. have to really approach this from the bottom up and build like a really strong foundation, uh, focusing on the local level, coordinating the local levels, and sort of gutting it from the bottom up. You know. Oh, I right. see. So, so instead would you of say that's your having... main Sorry, aim right? Kieran, go ahead. So, would you say that's your party's main aim right now? Then more instead of focusing on you know the White House right now, would you say you're more focused upon? getting a large follow let's say like from the campaign getting a large following from local people as he says a more grassroots approach rather than aiming for the top right away mm-hmm. absolutely i mean you know really running for um this particular office running a presidential campaign it's just a strategy uh to to really support um that local effort mm-hmm. So, you know, we've said this a lot in, in the press that we've done so far uh, with regards to this the uh, election, the number of votes we get, that, that's, that's not really, a, uh, you know. The important thing necessarily. Yeah. It's, uh, it's establishing, it's, it's building those relationships throughout the country on the local basis, helping to connect folks, um, doing whatever we can to remind folks, you know, how, how much power they do have. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the work is uh, as so like if we do a media piece like Vice covered the campaign a bit ago, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Like that comes out. Um, a lot of folks reach out to the campaign, and a lot of these folks are people who they've never been involved with like radical slash revolutionary politics before. Um, so their initial concerns are sort of fear based, you know, like. What's going to happen to me if I get involved with something like this, you know? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So we work hard to address those fears. Angela, uh, my running mate, and I, as, along with the folks who work with the campaign, work very hard to make ourselves like as accessible as we possibly can in real time um, to 
to, to, to let folks know, like, look, we're, we're going to have to work on this together. Yeah. Um, and uh, that we, we, their voices are, there's, that's sort of the critical piece to all this. So right. um, when folks reach out, you know, we, we respond and um, we do whatever we can to help them build those relationships within their communities. Um, I, correct me if I'm possibly mistaken. What would you say, like the um, the biggest uh, kind of hurdle, hurdling block for uh, trying to achieve that sort of uh, local trust level is um, kind of? I, I feel like there's a bit of a, a stigma against just left wing politics in general in the United States, yeah, especially like, in the 20th ha- century with McCarthyism and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the threat of socialist Russia. Um, mm-hmm. How do you how do you kind of combat that that stigma? Well, I think one thing that's happening is like when we look at polling data that shows, particularly among uh, like millennials, is that mm. the the perception and the attitudes towards socialism are they're, they're kind of changing rather rapidly. Um, and I think as I remember in 2011, there was a poll that either Gallup or Pew had done that showed that folks between the ages of 18 20, or, and 29 actually had a more favorable response to socialism than they did to capitalism. So I think what? the envi- Go ahead. No, sorry. I was um, I was just uh, I was I was expressing uh, intrigue. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. To carry on. To carry we continue on. to see this kind of information that comes from polling data. So I think as we move forward, uh, we're seeing more and more folks who are uh, receptive to the ideas. Um, yeah. Some of that I think is sort of gaining distance from the Cold War. Right. Um, probably, yeah. in my opinion, I think one of the biggest factors there is that um, because of the internet and because of social media. Um, folks have the ability to fact check in real time. So like if they get like bullshit propaganda from the news, they can do, you know, they can do their own research right then and there to find out whether or not that propaganda was accurate. And Right, right. And, you know, especially with the way people are now, everyone seems to be a bit more open-minded towards things and things like that. Mm-hmm. The thing that I find interesting, right, was because a lot of people, whenever you'd bring up the idea of socialism, they'd, they'd automatically would link it to communism, which obviously they're two different things, though they led to each other in history. And another thing, right, you know, they always talk about Stalinism and things like that, the Soviet Union, even though it was completely different as to what the actual ideals were. So I just right. find yeah I just find that quite interesting looking into it you know not too long ago, and I, that that may be another thing too is that I think folks are realizing um, because they can you know they can fact check they can research is that uh, you know Stalin and uh, you know Stalin's uh, Soviet Union that that wasn't communism you know that wasn't mm-hmm. socialism no, and I think folks are starting to find that out like mm. okay there was a propaganda campaign led in the U S. Um, you know, to and communism slash socialism what had been tied to what you know to Stalin's Soviet Union, and I think folks are starting to become increasingly aware that yeah, that that's not what that was. And I think for us right now today, what we're talking about is, of course, is is a different thing, and um, you know, we can point to you know to evidence, to fact. Um, to, to show folks, like, this is what we're talking about, you know, and it's not Stalin. Mm-hmm. So something that's quite interesting that I wanted to ask you, because especially with, uh, you know, the whole Sanders campaign, right, uh, mm-hmm. with the media branding him as a socialist, and he even used the term himself as a democratic socialist. And right. the thing that I find interesting was that if you actually, you know, looked into him, he really wasn't. He wanted to reform capitalism. Right. And what sets you apart from someone like him? in the whole grand scheme of things what would you say makes you unique well i I think you sort of touched on some key points um what he seemed to advocate was for more of like a social democracy he was kind of a it's like a progressive democrat trying to um expand the social safety net uh build you know a stronger welfare state Mm -hmm. and perhaps a little bit more of what we might see in like the scandinavian countries he wasn't talking about like worker ownership of production, community control, that democratic participation. And then, of course, his foreign policy um, is terrible. Um, you know, he had said that he would not end the, the um, uh, drone warfare, in the, uh, which is, is a huge problem. He's also, you know, had been a, um, a, a pretty strong supporter of Israel, which we see as an apartheid state. Um, right. So the differences, uh, they're not, um, 
inconsequential. They're, they're, they're rather large, you know? Mm -hmm. You're right. He was, I think he uses the term, I am a democratic socialist, you know? Right. But one, I think there was a little bit of, um, that was a strategic choice of words because socialism is, is, it's inherently democratic. I think by, for him, using that label, applying the democratic before socialist, I think, you know, it's an effort to sort of say, like, I'm not advocating, you know, Stalinism uh, because people in the U.S. may not, um, there are folks in the U.S. who may still see socialism as synonymous with uh, Stalin. Um, but in what he was actually advocating was, was it, it wasn't socialism. It's, um, you know, social democracy. Right. Um. <laughs> Uh, out of curiosity, um, and I was, I've been wondering this for a little while, but um, how would you, if you were talking to someone who wasn't necessarily as, uh, as um, on the same side of the political spectrum as you, what, what would you tell them to kind of get them to change their mind? I, I think this is really simple. I think if we're serious about human rights, um, th this, this, if we're serious about human rights... Yeah. Uh, to me, this this isn't that this isn't difficult. I think when you actually break this down by the issue, in my experience, folks will often say, one, this sounds like common sense, and two, they'll ask, why why aren't we doing this already? You know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I actually think that just having a very uh, you know, open discussion with people about uh, and, and being right, careful. What's that? I'm sorry. Sorry, right. uh, Kieran. Kieran seems to be having some difficulties. <laughs> oh no, sorry. I was right. Just got a member that had him over there. So I apologize. <laughs> okay. Oh, please continue. Sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry. Do carry on. Do carry That's on. It's okay. If I think if we listen to like you know what, what's going on in, in folks' lives, um, we can have a discussion and sort of point out how the system, the capitalist system, it's flawed by design. You know, um, and then it's really wonderful if they're able to make the connections themselves, you know, and if mm -hmm. they can kind of personalize this, yeah. um, I think it resonates uh, in a much stronger way than me telling folks, this is what you need to do. Um, that's not who I am. That's not who Angela is. Um, I know as Angela had said before, like we're not the kind of folks to preach to people about what they should be doing, you know? Um, right. But, uh, we are here for you know to listen and to have a dialogue, and that, that's what we do every day. I think that's what you touched upon before, just when we said someone who wasn't necessarily you know understood that was when you mentioned the stigma of social because a lot of people confuse socialism as like radical culture. As soon as they hear socialist, they think you know you know the power to the people and like going to be a big massive revolution. And everyone like everyone seem they think in extremes you know they can't really see it in a more reasonable light that was i think that was one concern we had when someone who has a socialist party have you noticed any sort of like backlash from people thinking that you're let's say a more radical party than you intend to be well i i, I think we don't shy away from uh you know the the radical label because i think you know the meaning of radical means at the root you know and we're, we are trying to address this at, at the root. As I mentioned, you know, seeing um, capitalism as the cause, we are trying to address this, that root cause. Um, I think a, some of this effort is actually reclaiming uh, the terminology. Um, whereas, like, the, the U.S., the state has really, like, uh, uh, disparaged these ter the, the terms, you know. Um, actually, last night I was at a, a community meeting and we were watching um, a, a speech by Hillary Clinton that she gave back in December in Minneapolis. And she continued to use the word like radical, um, but in addressing like ISIS, right? Um, well, radical, you know, um, she doesn't get to define the terminology, you know. Um, and to sort of control that national narrative. Um, yeah. So, you know, part of this effort is actually reclaiming the terminology, you know. Right. The, 
what does radical yes. mean? What does revolutionary mean? And, and actually having a discussion with people about what these things mean. Um, and I think that when we do engage in those discussions, um, people are generally pretty um, receptive. I think if, if we approach people um, as allies, as, as, as friends, neighbors, family, fellow students, co-workers, that sort of thing, that they're, they're generally pretty receptive. Mm -hmm. and um, it's Sorry, no, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, yeah, because you, you could kind of see the, th the same thing happen with many other words, like liberal being the biggest example. Whenever you'd hear that word, you'd instantly think it's an insult. But when you look at the definition of it, it, it states that you're an open-minded person. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's quite interesting the way you phrase that. Right. You know, we, we see a lot of this, that sort of effort in the U.S., like the co-opting of language, uh, right. <laughs> you know, uh, from those who want to, you know, control. Yeah, I'm sorry, Harry, you wanted to say something? <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, I was just wondering, because you, um, you, you mentioned Islamic State just now, and I was, I was wondering, since you were on the subject of uh, foreign policy, mm -hmm. how might a, um, because you, um, we, we spoke earlier about the military, mm -hmm. how might a Saltese government... Um, tackle the the problem of Islamic State. Well, I think like okay, if if we had a a socialist U.S., uh, yeah. I, I think with um, with Islamic State, uh, I think we we start at sort of a foundational level, and that's um, we stop creating them. You know, uh, we stop creating the Islamic states of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we look at the economic conditions uh, and factors that, that play a role into the rise of organizations like them. Uh, the foreign policy decisions, uh, you know, that, that give rise to organizations like this. And I, I, I think, you know, socialists, like, you know, we, we can actually point to very sort of ex explicit or specific, um, you know, policy choices that that give rise to, you know, outfits like Islamic State. And uh, again, these aren't really complicated um, solutions, you know. Uh, often I right. think with the U.S. when we, the so-called like threats that our government will present to the government, um, generally we're the cause, you know, of those threats. Mm -hmm. Um. It's it's interesting you mentioned that because the the Trump campaign has been constantly hammering on this point that uh, the Obama administration is responsible for the rise of Islamic State. Um, mm -hmm. How how true is that? Do you think that um, Obama and Clinton were responsible for Islamic States being as powerful as it now is? I mean, I, I, you know, I think if we look at Islamic State in particular, I mean, I think the roots of this they they, they um, you know they go back a little bit before Obama. I think when we look at the um, Iraqi occupation, um, when we look at like sort of that debathification process, uh, you know, yeah, like, or the rise of like Al Qaeda and the Taliban before them, and, and Al Qaeda in Iraq, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I think there's been some great literature about sort of the the formation and organization of Islamic State. Um, I believe in Camp Bukha, uh in Iraq. Um, so, you know, Obama has certainly been horrible in this regard, uh, but I think it's, in this particular instance, the origins might lie a little bit before Obama. I mean, he, he's, you know, in practice, he's horrible, you know, Obama, um, as has been Bush, as was Clinton, as was, you know, H.W. Bush, as was Reagan, <laughs> was, you know, it's terrible, yeah. so you can just go on and on and on. Mm. You know, we're we're in a, we're in imperialist country. You know, right. Like I, I suppose even all the way back to the time of the founding fathers, uh, most of whom held <laughs> held human chattel, didn't they? So uh, I mean, horrible. even as far back as the as the eighteenth century, you have examples of um, the the capitalist system being exploitative of the ninth of the lower of the uh, of the. I'm trying to think of the word. Absolutely. That there, but, but it, it's. It's, it's, it's been an institutional thing since almost day one, I suppose. It has. You know, we, we're a country with a racist foundation. Um, you know, this idea of protecting the, you know, the opulent minority from the masses and all that sort of stuff. You know, our, law, our legal system is set up to protect white property rights. Our law enforcement is an arm of that legal system. Uh, so our, our history is just, it's, you know, 
our hands are just our blood soaked, you know. Right. Um, and and I think you know, in terms of foreign policy, anytime um, a country, um, even you know, with democratically elected leadership, uh, anytime a country that sits on resources that the U.S. wants, you know, if that leadership says no, you can't have that. That belongs to us. Uh, either we're going to directly overthrow them, or, or we're going to work through proxies to have them overthrown, so that we can have access to those resources and we can profit from those resources. You know, mm-hmm. we can go back to Iran in 1953, or IND in Chile, uh, uh, Lumumba, on and on. You know, it's it's it, this is sort of like the U.S. is uh, it's cottage industry. You know. Yeah, I, and I find it quite interesting because, you know, a lot, you're kind of starting to see this pushback. This is something not me, Kieran, and uh, Harry had talked about a while ago, but you're starting to see this pushback on the, the establishment, not only here in America, but also across the world. Mm-hmm. And seeing, you know, third-party candidates like you gain attention and actually listen to people and talk about the issues, it, it's quite interesting to see this kind of happen now, you know. I think it's a really great thing, you know. Right, yeah. Uh, and I think the fact that, like, the three of you and I, like, that we can have these discussions um, and that we can use technology, um, you know, to, to best effect, to be able to have these kind of discussions, make these sorts of connections. Um, I think it's a really wonderful thing. And I think it bodes well for the future. And from where I stand as a socialist, um, you know, I'm very optimistic. Right. I think that's what you, to touch on what you said before, I think it is more, it was, a lot of the older demographic really had their heart set on, you know, capitalist equals good, communism equals bad, like socialism equals bad. Sure. And you said, you know, millennials having, act, you know, like you said, being able to fact check and things like yeah. that. People yeah. are more open to say, well, is it re- is it bad or is it good? I want to inform my own opinion. So they go and look up the facts and then say, well, it's not really, you know, this thing that's supposed to be bad and would never work it isn't exactly as right. bad as they say it is. Or it wasn't even the same thing, you know. Um, Just from before you said, like, when you think when a lot of people think of socialism, immediately they go to, to the nineteen forties in Russia, you know, like yeah. the Iron Fist and everything, and, and that's right. not the case as you've proven. One thing I've noticed, like uh, um, lately, particular in the U.S. among like uh, the reactionary side, is this effort to disparage millennials. And I think when we have a discussion like this. We can see why reactionary uh, forces would want to disparage millennials, you know, because millennials um, are sort of calling bullshit, you know. Yeah, yeah, that that's something I'll agree with when it comes to that, because you, you see that, especially in, you know, things like Fox News and stuff. They're always <laughs> talking about how millennials are unintelligent or that they don't know what's best for the country yeah. and things like that. Anyone you know? under the age of 25 ha- that has another political opinion, like, well, you're just a kid. You don't really yeah. understand. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? You can see why they'd have a vested interest in in shaping that narrative that millennials are, mm-hmm. you know, they're ignorant or they're they're too soft, uh, and this sort of thing. Well, you know, millennials pose a real threat to them because millennials have been using information and have been using technology, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to point out bullshit. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I definitely feel like uh, campaigns like yours and just the the movement in general have been have been really helped by the almost democratization of. Of the media, I suppose, because yes. uh, people of um, Kieran and uh, D- Dave's and my age group are relying far, far less on traditional news media. That's and great. I'm glad to hear that. Not to mention <laughs> the fact that with the rise of, of sites like YouTube and Daily Motion and, and Twitch to an extent, we can actually start almost shaping our own narrative. Like there's there's dozens of YouTube channels with millions of followers who are right. completely independent of the media establishment, which is, I think why the establishment is, is trying so hard to dis- to create that narrative because they are starting to become afraid that we don't need them anymore. And that's yeah, really... Coming up, so yeah. Right, that's really powerful. You know, everything you just said there, like I hear, that's a threat to, you know, uh, those who have this really that's strong right. interest in maintaining their power. You know, you just sort of outlined a threat to, you know, that tight grasp on that power... I, I, to me, like that makes me smile. I, I, that, that's really powerful. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> but no, definitely. With um, I do apologize. I think there's a plane going by. But um, I, I definitely feel like that sort of of rise of the internet, uh, and uh, podcasting technology like this, and just YouTube channels in general, and that sort of thing, have meant that we don't need to rely on 
the establishment for information anymore. We can start to rely on each other, which is sort of touching on what you said earlier about community control and mm. uh, communitarian trust and that sort of thing. Absolutely. So I really think it's it's a great thing that we're actually able to start. I mean, <laughs> even stuff like this, which is probably going to be seen by like 250, 300 people. I really think this sort of thing is going to start to be kind of the death throw of the establishment media. I agree. And I also think, like you mentioned, like, okay, let's say 250, 300 people, they see this particular program. Where do they go from there? Like, they, they hear a discussion like this. What's their next step, you know? Um, so this is why I see things like this is so important. You know, before, um, before we started the call and when you had mentioned, you know, well, thank you for having this discussion. Like, to me, these kinds of discussions are so important, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I'm just very grateful to be part of them. Right. Oh, we're, we're grateful uh, for you to, for you being here. Oh, yeah, but, um, thank you. Once again, thanks very much for taking the time. Oh, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, one thing I was wanting to ask quickly, just as you said, people, you know, they see someone has an interest peaked in this and is like, well, what is the next step? What is the best place would you say to reach, have more information about your party? Would it be say your Twitter or a YouTube page, or would it be, you know, you know your party's website itself? I, I think you mentioned a few different elements. We do use social media heavily, right? Like hmm. the campaign's got a Facebook page, a Twitter account, the Socialist Party's got a Facebook page. Um, they can go to the campaign website, which is R-E-V, as in victory, 16.us, rev16.us. Um, just Google Socialist Party USA and all the information will come up. Um, but, you know, we are very, and again, this is sort of in, lo in alignment with so many of the things we've talked about on this conversation. We are very mindful of, uh, you know, the idea of reaching people where they're at and acknowledge that, you know, I mean, obviously so many folks are tapped into social media and are using technology to find ways to make new connections. Um, so it's very important to us to, to, to be there, to be able to have a discussion. Right. Now, I, I kind of got a quick point to, to throw in here, but this is kind of interest me, right? But how is it like running as a third party candidate in the US, knowing that you guys don't get much media attention at all and you heavily rely on the Internet for coverage and things like that? Mm -hmm. um, I think from the start, we have to be very strategic about the choices that we make. You know, how mm -hmm. do we sort of get the, 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 the biggest impact with the options that we have available to us? So it's like, Every step we make, um, it has to be carefully considered, you know. We have to consider sort of our resources as an organization, what our capacity is, um, and then plan to get, you know, we don't have money to throw around, you know. Right, right. Um, oh, so right. we can't be frivolous in that regard. So when we do, th you know, when you see something that we do, there has been like a, a lot of careful consideration and strategic planning behind those choices, you know. Um and then sort of an analysis each step of the way, like, well, how effective was this particular strategy? You know, if it was effective, why? And how can we build on that? If it wasn't, why not? And how can we tweak it? You know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, as a third party candidate, and in particular, as a third party uh, candidate that is explicitly uh, radical slash revolutionary, you know, um, yeah. that we make no bones about the fact we are socialist, we are radical. You know, um, we, we, a lot of thought goes into how we, you know, proceed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, it's actually interesting that we were talking about this. Um, to go back to the subject of millennials, we've, uh, we noticed while we were doing some of the, the legwork for this episode that um, your campaign utilizes uh, uh, mimetic imagery as part of its campaign. The, uh, I think my personal favorite is probably the... Um, Everybody be like Clinton or Trump, and I'm just like, and then there's the picture of the guy <laughs> over the euro. <laughs> right, right. The you, know, you, you and your running mate. Um, yeah. Has um has that has that strategy almost has that strategy paid off for you? Uh yes. Um. So, okay. This is a, this is this is really wonderful. So, like, well, a lot of the graphic <laughs> design and a lot of the <laughs> ideas behind the graphic design, it's this isn't a case where like Angela or myself. <laughs> Where we are sort of, we're telling folks, this is what I want you to do with graphic design. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, it's millennials who are actually creating these pieces. You know, mm -hmm. um, so myself, I'm 41 years old, right? Um, 
And I think that for me, and I think Angela feels this way as well, uh, it's important to listen, you know? And if, if, um, if millennials, you know, if they put something together that, you know, they feel this expresses how they feel, um, if it's, a, it's a, like a design aesthetic that resonates with them, I think it's important for us to listen. So a lot of the pieces that you see that come out of the campaign were, have actually been created by millennials. And in terms of um, uh, like content and uh, direction, more often than not, um, they are creating the content and uh, you know putting things together in a way that they think makes sense. I do think it would catch the eye of someone who was a millennial a lot more than say the Republican Party is. I couldn't I couldn't see the Republican Party thinking, right, let's do you know like some it has a, a bit more of a humorous effect. They're very much oh no, see the politics is serious. You know you can't have a lighthearted yeah, uh, moment in politics. It's, I, oh, and just I was going to say quickly, um, sure. just as I suppose a little shout out, I would say when you said Angela, that was Angela Walker. Yeah, that's your vice presidential nominee as well. Correct. In the Correct. Yes, party. Angela Nicole Walker. As well, yes. just give a little shout out to her there. <laughs> just one of the hard feelings I've ever had. She's awesome. Uh, Angela ran for sheriff in Milwaukee County in 2014, um, and um, she got almost 70,000 votes. Oh wow. She, she, she's an amazing um, community organizer, uh, and and to me, she's just she's the real deal, you know. Um, I think you know, Aunt, like you'll see a lot of times in that imagery, like look, Angela and I, we're, we're both you know covered in tattoos. Um, we're we're not uh, sort of ivory tower, you know, candidates. We're community members, you know. Uh, we work with our communities. Um, that's what we do on a daily basis. And I think our, we make a choice when we present the ticket um, is, is to just show folks this is who we are. You know, um, there's not a lot of pretense um, or posturing. It's just this is who we are on a daily basis. Um, we're no different than anybody else. And to really, uh, particularly when we consider radical politics in the U.S., I think one way that we can really help folks feel comfortable about involvement with radical politics, mm. if they can see themselves in like the campaign, um, that really helps them identify with this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So we do whereas, make... it's like it's sort of like whereas with larger campaigns like the Democratic and Republican campaigns, there's so, there's such a large campaign staff behind both of them that individual touches get lost in translation and people just kind of look at it as, oh, they're Democrat, I'm Democrat, I guess I'll vote for right. them. And you know what? Like when we were starting to put the pieces together for the campaign, yeah. some of the folks that we talked to who felt who feel so thoroughly alienated from electoral politics mm. and, and listening to them and, um, you know, when they say like, shit, when I see a candidate who's dressed in clothing that I can't afford – talking at me, my ears turn off, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. I feel like you've got nothing to do with me, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I understand that. I mean, I, I feel the same way, you know? Uh, but if, if candidates are, are explicit about like, look, I'm here for the dialogue, you know, I'm here to listen and to figure out ways that we can work together. Okay. Then I might, you know, I, I might be a little bit more inclined to, to get involved. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Sorry, while we were I, I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, while we were actually on the subject of that, I was I was I was curious about something about the Socialist Party itself. Mm -hmm. um, does it have um, a nominating process in the same way as the traditional parties do? And if so, what led you to choose uh, Miss Walker specifically as your as your running mate? As your VP. Yeah. Right. We, we do have a convention, like a national convention. Ours took place in October of 2015. It actually took place in Milwaukee, which is where Angela's from. Uh, so it, it, delegates do come to a convention. Uh, you know, delegates are um, voted on at the local level throughout the country. Yeah. Um, they go to the convention and uh, they vote, one, do we even want to run a presidential campaign? And two, if we do... Uh, what will the ticket be? As far as Angela goes, um, I, I'm being completely honest with you um, when I say that when I thought about doing this and thought about reaching out to somebody, 
she was the only person that um, I, I had considered. And I, I, what I thought of Angela, I was really unsure about whether or not she'd be uh, willing to, to do this. But I was very hopeful because she was the only person that um, I had on my list. You know, I was a fan of her campaign in 2014 um, and just held her in such high regard. And um, I, I just said this recently, like, she's just one of those people when she talks – I really listen. You know, when she writes something, I read what she has to say. So I have tremendous respect for her as an organizer. I was hopeful and, um, you know, we had a, a, a long conversation and thankfully she accepted. That's excellent to hear. She, um, she certainly yeah. sounds like a, she certainly sounds like a very capable uh, running mate Sh for you. Shit, yeah. She's a <laughs> badass. <laughs> Can we can we quote that please? Just if it happens on the show. <laughs> it's the truth. She's a bad I would like I would like to say that just be like, and I have a quote here from your other candidate. Uh shit, yeah, you are a badass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> For sure. Um uh where were we? Oh yeah, that's right. Um since there's such uh talk about on the internet in particular, there's so many uh I, I use the word sparingly, but there's so many memes almost about uh, Trump's divisive, uh, Donald Trump's divisive campaign. Like we're gonna, we're gonna block all Muslims from the country. Uh, we're gonna build a wall with Mexico. Um, if you don't mind me asking, on a scale of one to ten, how big is the wall for the Socialist Party? <laughs> how big would you build the wall if you were Donald Trump? Wait, okay, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> If I was Donald Trump? How, if you were Donald Trump, and it was day one in the White House, and you were building the wall on the Mexican border, how tall would that wall be? If I was him. <laughs> I know, horrible <laughs> though it is to think about. <laughs> I should say, this is one of the less uh, serious questions. Yes, please know this is a light-hearted question. We're not... <laughs> like, this is like, Genuinely, Donald Trump is my least favourite politician, but if out I was of Donald curiosity... Trump. I guess, like, the first thing I would do would be, like, shit, if I was in D.C. and if I was Donald Trump, I would walk to the Atlantic Ocean and I would just keep walking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and That's what a lot uh, of Republicans hope he would do as well. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, uh, shit. <laughs> I mean, damn, I, I, putting myself in his shoes. To be fair, that's a pretty good position, though, when... You ask all the hard-hitting questions and you answer them without a beat, but it's the light-hearted one. That <laughs> 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 like, damn, if, I'm Donald, if I was Donald Trump, like, I, I don't know that I'd want to say on the radio what my what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, shit. Probably oh. And probably invest in a better toupee. And probably what I'm <laughs> like I said, yeah. uh, just. I, Fuck. Uh, <laughs> can we, that, that, can that should also be a quote. That, that, that pretty much sums up what it would be like to right, do just like Donald many Trump. people. You're just like Donald Trump. Fuck. Oh. <laughs> Man, what a nightmare. Oh, right. I mean, well, actually, on that subject, if it were like if this election were completely nightmarish and there were genuinely only the two candidates, Clinton and Trump, who would you who would you vote for? Between the two of them, yeah. between Clinton and Trump, I know it's like, it's kind of synonymous with being either I don't the lesser of two evils scenario. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who do you consider the lesser of those two evils between Clinton and Donald Trump? Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, I don't. I, I don't think I, I. I. I would vote. I mean, the, the thing is, even though there are more candidates in the U.S., um, one of the two of them will win the election. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. my guess is Hillary will win the election. Um, who do I consider lesser two evils? You know what's funny is like, I, if if I'm somebody who lives, let's say I live in um, uh, Pakistan or Yemen, um, and you know a a, do a drone strike kills my family, I don't know that I see either one of them as lesser evil. You know, right? I, right. I think they're both oh, because that drone is just right. Yeah. Like, who does it matter who sent it? I mean, the, is the drone democratic or republican? Does right. that matter? <laughs> you know, I, I, I've said this before in, in, a, in, a, in an incredibly hypothetical situation where we were to win, 
you know, I would be a war criminal on day one in this system, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, the system is so, um, it, like I said, it's flawed by design, you know? Yeah. Um, so whoever sits in that office is going to be a war criminal, is, is going to sh lesser of two evils. It's like, well, the system is evil. So yeah. does it matter who's driving the system? I mean, I, right. guess in an, I guess to a degree, the fact that people have to choose between the lesser of two evils in the American system is part of why the system is so completely fundamentally broken. Like, Absolutely. And you know what's really fucked up is that, like, mm. um, as, as, as working people, uh, you know, paying our taxes, like, we finance this shit, you know? Mm. We right, finance right. the murder of folks throughout the world. Uh, yeah. So really it's like we have been hijacked by them, you know, they're the terrorists. Yeah. Like so, you're talking, sorry, yeah. To make us, you know, complicit in, you know, the murder and destruction of the planet, mm. um, it, 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 it's, it, it's so profoundly um, disgusting, you know, yeah. uh, that my tax dollars have financed the slaughter of people throughout the world the slaughter of people here at home, uh, in the U.S. destroy the planet. I, you know, it, it, it's it. I almost don't have words to express how disgusting that is. Right, yeah. and it's kind of it's when you think about it more and more, it's like, well, I finance this without even consenting to it. You know, it just makes you feel like you're right. responsible for it. I mean, evidently, given you know the the spending of both of both parties, mm -hmm. no way you can vote can change the outcome the military no. budget is still going to be stupidly high regardless of whether the president is democratic or republican, republican or, yeah yeah right. and that's There's, what i'm saying like even if i made it into office this election it would mm. that would still continue to be the case the system has to be replaced yeah mm. because even if even if in the shall we say ideal situation in which you become the president um you would still by virtue of the constitution be required to put all of the bills through Congress, which is, again, entirely dominated by the two establishment parties. Right. Which like, means that... I, I, I'm re I don't mean to be defeatist in any way. <laughs> and no, I do understand. It's realistic. That's why I say, like, when we started this conversation, that when you asked the question, like, how do we get there? How do we do this? This is why the focus is on the local level and building from the bottom up, you know, and sort of gutting it from the bottom up. Right. So you would say instead of trying to play it by their game and playing it by the system's rules, you're working towards, as you said, building your own system. That's why it's more that's like running for the presidency, uh, to phrase, is more of a means to an end rather than actually trying to go through the process of becoming president. Right. Absolutely. Like I said, you know, this is just a strategy. Um, it's one tool in a giant toolbox that we yeah. use to contribute to, you know, that revolutionary effort. Mm -hmm. So it's less about replacing the president and more about replacing the presidency in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sentence. It's very much about replacing the system. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm, I'm wondering about how you, what your opinion is of the, because I'm sure you'd be quite um, a vocal opponent of, uh, of the, of the system, but um, I'm wondering what your opinion is of the electoral college. Again, you know, uh, bullshit. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, I agree. You know. I was going to say, I wasn't expecting much of a fan. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, sorry. Well, yeah. I, Just, it, all this, it, it, it's sort of like, you know, when I think about things like this, it, it really sort of drives home how much work we have to do, you know? Yeah. Right. And how important it is that, uh, that, that we really make progress with that effort of building at the community level, you know, um, and that people uh, step into that power that they have. Um, and I say this fully acknowledging that uh, the powerful, they're not going to give that power up without a tremendous fight. Um, oh, completely. You know, yeah. so I do acknowledge that. And I don't mean to sound sort of flippant, um, about what we're facing here, um, but there really is no alternative, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to fight. 
it, one it, thing it, I was going to ask, just when you said about people, you know, to kind of go on a topic somewhat related, and you said about people not wanting to give up things without a tremendous fight. Mm-hmm. Say, again, hypothetically, in the ideal world, you became president, and the system, you know, the socialist system came into place. Mm-hmm. How would you address, say, like America's debt to China using like a more socialist economic system? As well, how would you go about the debts that America owes to certain countries? As it would have to be, a, you know, like you said, a different way of doing it than the, uh, than the norm, than the capitalist way of doing it. Right. Okay. So, like, anything that we do, um, when we look at, like, the progress that we make, we sort of acknowledge that it's going to exist in a context. Like, as we make a, a transition to a socialist society, um, if you look at, like, our platform – You'll see that, um, like when we when we talk about economics or international relations and all that sort of thing, there are those efforts uh, to transition, and there's an acknowledgement that there's going to be a transition, so that we look at sort of international relations in a context. So um, we talk about canceling third world debt, uh, you know, scrapping the free trade agreements. Uh, how to explain this? Like, so that it's not one singular move that we make. Like, if we look at debt to China, you know, that's not something that exists in isolation as one single policy choice. Right. Uh, it's you know, um, so I, I think with a, like an isolated question like that, like. What do we do about debt to China? You know, mm-hmm. uh, well, I could say, you know, well, we pay our debt to China. You know, uh, uh, but what what does what does what does that mean? You know, <laughs> uh, so I think it's like I look at something like that and see that in the broader context of what it is we're talking about. If the U.S. Uh, transitions to this vision that we have, you know. What do bo- what, how do we address borders? You know, um, so they're, they're, they they all sort of sit within this this broader context. You know, um, we I think we call for I know we call for canceling uh, the developing world's debt. Uh, you know, getting out of the UN, uh, all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, you know, with regards to debt to China, like I could say that. You know, we would choose to pay off our debt to China. Um, yeah. But I understand it was a more, you, you think about it as more, not so much just that question, it's more a broad demographic. What about all the debts to different countries? Of what is owed and, you know, what we owe and what was owed to us. Yeah. You know, all right, I'll pay this guy off and then, you know, problem right, solved. Right, right. Absolutely. You know, it's uh, the, like, Shit, we could pay China, you know the debt off to China. What does that mean? You know, mm-hmm. um, how would that tie into sort of the the broader like that broader socialist effort? Right. Um, if I might um, touch on something you said just now, uh, you mentioned you uh, would be a proponent of America leaving the United Nations. Right. How do you feel that the United Nations has uh, failed necessarily? Um, well, one, you know, like. The, U- the U.S. has a, a, a permanent seat on the U.N. Security Council. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think when I think of the U.N., um, I think it is sort of uh, uh, as an arm of the U.S. hegemony, you know? Um, I see, yeah. Especially you know, yeah. when we look yeah. at, like, okay, let's take a look at, like, when we see votes on Israel and, and on the Israeli-Palestinian question, you know, uh, Often we'll see votes that are 171 to 1, 171 to 2, or whatever they might be, you know, uh, when questions about, uh, you know, violation of international law, Israeli violation of international law, you know, with the U.S. as the one or two or three, uh, you know, no vote, um, to me it's, you know, the U.N. is like, well, what we say goes, you know. Yeah, right, right. Especially, um, it was it was very much the same uh, during the Korean War because it was a supposedly UN police effort, but right. America funded like ninety five percent of the UN at that time. Right. So it is very much. A, I I I do agree with you to an extent. I do think it's very American dominated. 
Right. For sure. You know? Um, so yeah. I just, we, I think seeing that is like an, another, uh, another, uh, sort of manifestation of, of U.S.'s, you know, global dominance. Mm -hmm. Quite right. Well, so you said there's one of the things you would want to, you know, take down, as you said. Dismantle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, this, one, this one we heard you say, you know, leave the U.N., we were a bit, not surprised, but we wanted to know the reasoning behind them. But now you have said that it does seem, you see the U.N. as more, just another part of the, of the system that you want to break down. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And sorry about the real quick. The last question about um, China. As you're asking me this, um, my landlord actually like walked through my front door. <laughs> <laughs> oh. What are they doing? They're going to do some sort of inspection inside here. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So... Oh, so apparently the landlord came in because they're gonna they want to do some sort of inspection inside all of the apartments here. Oh, okay. I see. Fair enough. So sorry about that. I was just uh, no, that's, that's quite a rise. That's quite looking through the door and like, what the what the hell's going? On? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, when the landlord comes through the front door and inspects <laughs> like, the better part of the things that could have been said there, um, <laughs> I was just like, what the hell's what, what the hell's going on? Um, but I guess to I guess to touch on the last point before we wrap up because you have been going for like an hour now. Um, especially with the way the U.S. holds power on the world, uh, I think we best can see this with the whole Snowden allegations, right? When they you know, kind of just were the puppet masters to the entire countries, not allowing him to pass in certain places and eventually canceling his passport, leaving him in Russia. How do right. you feel about that, that sort of control that we have? So are you talking specifically about like the war on whistleblow whistleblowers? Like, uh, um, when you say the control that we have, um, I guess to an extent, yeah, the war on whistleblowers, but more to like seeing the underlying structure of how we can somewhat control every country, even though they're supposed sound like, to be see, independent. If someone, even if they escape from America, see, even they're in Sweden, America still has the power to tell the Swedish authorities, no, like shut down his passport, no, let him right, leave. Right. Yeah. Again, you know, we're just like with the last couple. The last question, talking about like U.S. hegemony and uh, how oppressive and uh, pervasive that you know that power is, uh, it's disgusting. You know, right. um, I, as a socialist and as a member of the Socialist Party and as a candidate, you know, you want to be able to say like no more. You know, mm -hmm. um, and again, as a taxpayer, I finance this. You know, um, it's incredible. It's. You know, I, I, I do understand to some extent how folks can feel like nihilist in the face of this, what, you know, this incredible power that the U.S. has and how, how we might approach uh, dismantling that power. It, it can seem like a task that's insurmountable. Um, right. And I, like I said, I, I can understand to some extent sort of the nihilism in the face like that. Like, well, we're screwed, you know, and we can't win. Um, but I just, I don't think there's, you know, there's another choice outside of fighting. We have to fight. Quite yeah. So. Obviously. It does seem an interesting point. I can, I definitely see where you're coming from, yeah. Yeah. You know. And so. the, the thing is, we hope that, you know, by getting you on the show, we can possibly get other, you know, third party candidates and try to help spread the awareness of you guys. Because it's quite interesting to see that, you know, instead of working towards talking to everybody, uh, America has turned to not debating anymore, more or less accepting what is reality, you know. Right. Yeah. And a lot of the questions that you asked about sort of like the how to, how do we get there? You know, when we see like presidential debates, like w that's not the kind of discussion that, you know, folks are having. You're getting sort of these sound bites that are just these like empty platitudes, you know, just... Um, right, yeah, right. Instead of addressing the real problems, they're kind of just going at each other saying why they're bad as a person. <laughs> you know, so, we, like, we don't see discussions like this on, um, like, mainstream media. Right. <laughs> and, and so, again, I think this all sort of highlights the importance of, of um, the use of technology. Uh, you, you, I think you had said sort of the democratization of the media you know, how important that is um, and how that bodes for the future. Yeah, right. Definitely. And one thing as well, as I hope by getting you on here, we, there are some, because I know we do have a fair few people watching tonight, I do hope we have, you know, some people that like to go out and check, you know, your website, as you said. Sure. 
instead of looking, you know, try and find the answers themselves, you know, have a look at the website, have a look at the Twitter, yeah. to really yeah. see for yourself, is this the party for you? Or just let have a little more of a perspective on it. Don't believe just what you've been told about it. Go and see for yourself whether or not that's as, as bad as everyone thinks. Right. Do the, do the legwork, right. yeah. Absolutely. I'm with you 100%. I was going to say, man, um, just probably because we're probably getting ready to wrap up now. Yeah. Um, just quickly, really, thank you again, Mr. Soltisic, for coming on and taking the time out. To oh, absolutely. Stuff. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for reaching out. Re it's very grateful to be able to speak with you. I mean, oh, it's and, excellent to speak with you. Yeah, and before I guess we let you go, uh, what did you think of us as like a group talking to you and stuff? <laughs> like, you know, you can give us your honest opinion about how you felt about this whole thing. I thought it was a blast, you know. Like, <laughs> I, 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 I feel like this kind, these kinds of conversations, um, this is the kind of kind of conversations I think that like you know, um, candidates should be having, and right. uh, definitely, like these are really important questions. Um, you all actually asked questions about how do we get there. Um, generally, that's not the kind of stuff that. Uh, like when we do have media opportunities that we discuss, um, mm -hmm. that or that we have an opportunity to discuss. So, I, I thought your questions were really wonderful. Thank you. Very, thank you very much. That's why that one's going up on the fridge. Me, me. <laughs> <laughs> very, very first interview wasn't a complete disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, thank you all so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank thanks you. again for being on, and I hope to. Maybe we'll get you on again in a few, and or probably Miss Walker to see if we can get her on. I'm sure she would love that. That would be awesome. But, thanks again, Mike. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Uh, and you. See ya.